the banks just reported their earnings and I want to analyze them. So I'm joined by someone who has intimate knowledge of the banks. She has worked uh, at several of them as an underwriter, as an analyst analyzing bank stocks. And she is now actually the director of finance at Blockworks, the company that I also work for. We are joined by Alex Gray. Alex, great to have you here. How are you doing? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, of course. So, you know, Alex, when people talk about earnings, uh, bank earnings, it's they, you know, one dollar was expected and the actual earnings per share was a dollar ten or it was 90 cents. That doesn't really matter because, you know, it's all made up, as you and I will talk about later. Uh, but just at this juncture, let's start by talking about with you know interest rates rising because of the Federal Reserve and with the you know, business cycle kind of slowing down. How would you, you know, as a former analyst of bank stocks, go about finding the value or the earnings power of, of banks, like profit prospects going forward? You think about a couple of different things when you're valuing banks or, or thinking about the longer term um, opportunities as an investor. So the, the first piece you mentioned is profitability, which is obvious, right? Um, but the second piece of that is actually available capital. Uh, because the way that it tends to work in banks specifically is all of the assets in the book are risk rated and they're held to a certain standard where you say this these are this is our tranche of best assets and from that tranche they're able to basically uh, they are allowed to do share buybacks and dividends and those types of like capital outputs that investors love. And so we as investors want to see that CET1 ratio, the really good tranche of assets go up because that improves the odds that they're going to give that back to the shareholders in some capacity. And then the, so the, the first and most obvious one, profitability, um, you know, the, the thing that really stole the show today doesn't surprise anyone is that rising rate environment. Um, Bank of America and Wells Fargo really being held to the highest standard of being able to take advantage of that. And that's because they have loan books that are more risk sensitive. And what that means is their ability, they have large corporate loan books, and those books are all variable rate. And so their loan book side of the house is going to be able to appreciate those interest rate increases faster than the other side of their balance sheet where they're they're paying for the privilege of the capital. Um, and so for a couple of quarters, if they negotiate that equilibrium correctly, they have the highest opportunity for that widest spread. Right. So if you own bonds, as interest rates go up, the value of that bond actually goes down because it's a fixed rate thing. Most, most bonds are fixed rate, whereas the vast majority of loans, as you said, are variable rate. And that's why people say when interest rates go up, you got to buy the banks and banks do well because they make more money. To what degree is that true? I know you spent um, a lot of the, the 2010s working inside a bank when interest rates were you know, basically zero. What was it like? What did what was the attitude towards profitability like? And, you know, specifically, you know, were, were loans being made that just weren't profitable at all, but say, hey, it's my job to make loans, so I'll make loans. There's like a couple of different dynamics. Um, over that period of time of low interest rates, you still want to see banks building their book, you know, particularly in that variable interest space, because those are the same books that are going to be able, like the the existing books are the ones that are going to be able to appreciate how fast rates have increased in the last few months. Um, So you're still, you're still looking for that loan growth. And then everyone just kind of acknowledges that we'll talk about NIM. So that NIM is the net interest margin Um, and that is basically, it's the relationship between the income that you make on loans versus the price that you pay to bring in the capital to then lend out. Um, and so it was really, there was a lot of focus on, so for the investment banks, there's a lot of focus on, you know, deal flow, the asset managers, net inflows in that same period of time. And it was really, it was just shifting focus, you know, because, the banks kind of, they fly together in the interest rate environments in terms of like doing well, not doing well. There's certainly winners and losers, as I talked about with Wells Fargo and Bank of America. So they're not all made equal, 
Um, but in that environment on the calls, you will hear back to back to back. No one's really talking about the interest side of income because it's just, you know, it's, it's very clear the environment that everyone's operating in. You're still looking for loan growth and um, you spend a lot of time talking about fee income, which is basically, you know, investment banks charging large amounts of money to execute deals. And even, you know, in the regional banks, you've got treasury management income. Um, and that is, you know, an interesting opportunity when you think about how many, like the size of businesses that all need those types of services. So it's remote check deposit. And, you know, I want to put a uh, Fed funds overnight sweep on top of my business bank account, which, you know, is a lot less popular when interest rates were zero. But um, there's a lot of different sort of services and value adds that banks can provide um, when they're not focused as much on growing that loan book. And so as the rate changes, it's you just see a shift in the conversation and, and you hold banks to a different standard um, in terms of what you look for as like the highest priority things. And so, you know, one other thing, so that was all income side of the house, but another thing everyone was looking for at that time is like, what are you doing about expenses? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, from that standpoint, the economy was strong. You're, you don't typically, you, Goldman Sachs is a little bit of a different business model. Yeah. Um, in that sort of healthy economy, you're not going to see a bunch of layoffs. It's not, you know, they're not going to be driven to cutting expenses by cutting people necessarily. Um, and I, a lot of the push and pull at that time was banks want to be technology companies. And that requires reinvesting capital into the business that they would otherwise send out to the investors. And because that capital is so transparent, investors say, oh my gosh, JP Morgan, your technology expense went up 25% quarter over quarter. And what are you, what are we getting out of it? And you just kind of have to trust them. We're doing stuff <laughs> that's going to make us a better business, a better technology company down the road. So I guess just to, to wrap all of that up, you still look for loan growth, but you get really particular about fee income and cutting expenses in that environment. Right. Okay. So when interest rates are at zero, risk-free interest rates, I'm just going to make this up. The loan spread is 250 basis points. So you're getting 2.5%. That's very little. And when you take into account you know, offices, um, uh, you know, labor cost, and just risk in, in general, you're, it's, it's not a super profitable thing to, to make loans. Uh, when interest rates are so low. So you try and make it on, on other things, those fees, those sort of weird businesses that uh, people who aren't in banking don't, don't typically think of. But now that interest rates are high and net interest margins have gone up, the conversation, as we saw today, Alex, is about uh, net interest margins. And I'm just looking at JP Morgan's, their uh, uh, interest rate spread. So basically, NIM uh, was 1.58% in the fourth quarter of 2021. Now it's 1.99%. So that is uh, really improving the profitability. And that uh, interest rate spread is the spread, the differential between the rate that JP Morgan earns on its assets, which has gone up a lot, and the rate that uh, JP Morgan pays for its deposits or its assets, which has also gone up, on, up a lot, but not as much. I think right now they're paying 1.37% for deposits in the fourth quarter of 2022, uh, up from zero a, a year ago. And that uh, rate, you know, so there are people who are JP Morgan and, um, you know, if any, anyone who has a checking account or I guess, yeah, and loan on a savings account, checking account is, is free, but, you know, they're getting 1.37%. Meanwhile, the Fed funds rate is 4.5%. So banks kind of just get to, you know, they, they make money for free, basically, right? <laughs> um, well, you always have to bring in the risk adjusted component, right? So, okay. They're, they're, the spreads are expanding, but they're expanding to compensate for increased risk, and they're expanding to compensate for fewer funds being available. So, you know, in the short term, yes, because, you know, rates went up so fast that they're being able to appreciate those rates off of the same base book that, in theory based on, you know, the economic indicators that we look at shouldn't be troubled yet. Um, and so when we think about loans and the money that we make, the money, the money that banks make on loans, you always have to think about it from the risk adjusted perspective, because 
at the same time, you hear, you know, a lot of sentiment about NIM improving. The other really big topic of this morning was credit quality. And mm -hmm. there's a couple of different things that play into that because it's not just loans might default and we'll have to write those off and that's an expense for banks. It's more complicated than that because they take their own economic forecast and they use that as the baseline to create the calculations for like provision and the allowance for expected expense. And so the worse they see the forward looking environment, the more expensive their own capital gets. And they have to do it that way because I mean, so, and you know, a one off tangent on that, just to make sure everything is exceedingly complicated all the time. Yeah, we love it that way. Yeah, yeah. The equation yeah. for arriving. <laughs> the equation for arriving at those volumes, the, the provision and the allowance actually aren't apples to apples at each bank. They don't have to do it the same. The way the Fed works, you know, most uh, much like the way that we have to calculate our own taxes and then say, is this right? Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a very similar premise where they said, hey, banks, we need you to put this in place so that, you know, from a provision standpoint, what we want is we want you to take it as an expense over a period of time so that we don't wake up one day and you take all your expenses at one time and now you're insolvent. But they don't actually prescribe the way. They say, you have to go do that. We'll check you and we'll make sure we're okay with how you're doing it. But it's not prescriptive. And so even when we think about what banks are provisioning for, it's not the same strategy because it's their own economic forecast and it's their own calculation. And so the, you know, the way to think about the, the forward looking of that dynamic is you get that net interest income, but you also should be expecting higher provisions and, you know, higher charge offs as we, as we meet the time that that is. I, I think charge offs are really a lagging indicator. I think, um, it's really interesting on the call this morning, Jamie Dimon said, you know, stop asking me for guidance on the, the credit stuff. Look at charge offs because that's what's already happened. Or it's like yeah, he's talking yeah. to a bunch of equity analysts who are like, what already happened doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Tell me what's going to happen. So can you explain the difference between what is what is an, uh, a net charge off versus the uh, building reserve? So reserves are, as you say, uh, banks say, oh, we're just going to lose money. So we're going to, you know, book a loss now rather than forward. But is, is a net charge off when they actually real like, how does a net charge off actually happen? You know, do they realize, hey, no one's paying us? Yeah. So you see, you see net charge offs in the consumer space um, on, you know, consumer loan products. And you also see it in the commercial space. And in terms of level of visibility, different banks provide different views um, and, you know, in terms of like getting into that granularity, but it is, it's essentially, we have decided that we are not going to collect that loan. So we are going to charge it off and take a loss. It's going to leave the balance sheet and we're going to take an expense on the income statement. Yeah. So there's, uh, so, so like main street banking and then, and, and wall street banking, uh, you know, investment, wall street banking is sales and trading, uh, investment banking, which Goldman Sachs, who I think we'll hear from next week, uh, is is very similar. And, and sales and trading is somehow, to my astoundment, they continue to make tons of money just because like things are so volatile, interest rates, commodities. But inv investment banking of oh, we're going to help you raise debt, we're going to help you issue equity, we're going to you're a SPAC, we'll help you do a SPAC. That business is you know down something like fifty percent year over year. But the main uh, uh, main street lending is actually a pretty good business so far because people are using the credit cards. Uh, uh, companies are, are borrowing money. There's a lot of consumer consumer debt. Um, yeah. Like, so tell us about your expertise. Do you work in commercial banking or, or middle market banking? And, and describe exactly what that is. Cause I think that's a really important sector to, to, to talk about now. Yeah, sure. So I, um, for a period of time, I did um, corporate banking underwriting, essentially. Um, and, and what that means is you have a portfolio of clients um, that you are on the, the deal team for. So most of the way it's set up, um, and I think this is fairly standard through the industry, is you've got 
a relationship manager that kind of like runs, you know, we call him the quarterback or her. Um, and they're, they are kind of a generalist. They, they understand how to identify opportunities for the bank and for their clients. And they'll bring in different sort of, you know, subject matter experts um, as they see opportunities. So on a deal, a deal team for any given client, you'll have the relationship manager, you'll have a treasury management specialist that's going to be looking for those, you know, the treasury management product we talked about earlier, um, a loan person, we have, uh, you know, an FX person. So basically, you know, put all of the capital markets activity in one tranche, um, and, you know, you're just, you're, you're partnering with clients to make sure that they have the, you know, capital and the, and the banking support that they need to grow their business. Um, so my role was on the lending piece and, and what that really entailed was, you know, so, so the, the, the existing book of clients, but also supporting prospecting and basically saying, um, here is your need. Let's help fit you with the best product. And let's protect the bank's interest with the best structure. And then when you put those two together, you land on what the right interest rate probably is. And then you go to market and you compete with other banks and you take that down a little bit more. And so um, it's, it's really the process of understanding the best way to help your clients capitalize from a debt perspective um, through, through fitting them with the right product. So is it, is it a line of credit? Is it a term loan? You know, if we, if we identify that a bond deal is the right deal, you know, we throw that over to capital markets cause it's sort of, you know, an entirely different game when it, as, as far as like that, that structure is concerned. Um, and it's, it's been, it's, it's added a really interesting and helpful perspective to just kind of understanding, what's going on in the world today and, and where I, you know, personally see the, the biggest risks and, and challenges for the industry going forward, which is to say, I'm intimately aware of the process of seeing a loan come up for renewal with an existing client and trying to understand what's where their business is today versus where it was and ensuring that the bank continues to be protected. And I think Something that doesn't get talked about enough is that it's not just rates that are going to go up for companies. And that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal mm -hmm. that every single day a loan is coming up for renewal with a company and it's going to be refinanced at a significantly higher rate. And it is, it's going to be a huge impediment to business, which as it's designed to do, right? We're doing all of this on purpose. Um, so it's really going to stymie growth. And, you know, worse than that, you say like, okay, these public companies, they're not just going to say, oh, our cost of debt went up. I guess our earnings went down because that's, that's not how they're incentivized to function. And, you know, they will find those expenses somewhere and, you know, it, it will be people eventually. And, you know, the thing that I keep thinking about is like, we always talk about rising rates and connection with inflation for consumers, but it's not going to matter if, uh, you know, bread is 10 cents if no one has a job. And so in addition to debt just getting progressively more and more expensive, you know, for basically the same capital needs they needed before, the structures are also going to tighten. And so what that means is banks have a surprising amount of control over the strategic decision making of companies and the way that they capitalize. So, you know, an example of that is it, it, it all comes back to we want to make sure our interests are protected if you deteriorate and go out of business. And so every dollar that goes out the door is a bank's business. And that uh, you know, that also comes down to like mergers and acquisitions, dividend, uh, you know, any kind of distribution to shareholders is going to be heavily controlled. If they see you start to deteriorate in any kind of meaningful manner, your new loan structure is not only going to be more expensive, but it's going to keep you from, you know, providing that type of value to shareholders. But also they may keep you from going to get a loan somewhere else. Like, okay, I have a $10 million line of credit. 
in good times, I only use 2 million of that to operate my business, but I'm seeing some deterioration in my business. Now I'm using 10 million of it. My bank's not comfortable with me. So they're not increasing that. They're actually making it more expensive and they're going to stop me from going down the street and getting another loan from a different bank to fill the difference. And so it's, you know, it, it really, it, you're going to hit, get hit twice when you think about growing as a company in a high rate environment, because it's going to be more expensive and the banks are going to be more restrictive on what you can do, other avenues you can pursue to grow. So it's, it's because the uh, commercial bank loans are floating rate, the interest rate is going up all the time, right? Because so if it's SOFR plus 200 basis points, when SOFR goes from 20 basis points to 520 basis points, then you have to have to pay, you know, 720 basis points. So it doesn't, it, uh, there's um, that rollover risk is, is it, it happens every single second, right? Or every, every single day. Um, but then you're saying once you people from the company sit down with the bank, the bank on top of that is going to say, oh, by the way, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. What are those um, sorts of things? And then what is the sort of collateral? You know, if the company defaults, what assets can the bank uh, uh, seize as, as their own property and sell off? Like a you know, mortgage is collateralized by the house. Uh, typically, credit card loans are not collateralized by anything. Um, yeah, what a, a commercial real estate uh, uh, collateralized by the real estate. So if, if you lend to a company and they default, yeah, what, what does the bank get? So that's a really great question. And it, it calls out sort of the other part of that equation when we think about structure. So what I was hitting on was really like covenants in terms of what you can and cannot do strategically. Um, collateral is the other really big piece of that. And it varies wildly in terms of the types of structures you see in the industry. Um, and your ability to post more collateral obviously is going to put you in a lower risk tier of client and it's going to get you a better rate. So there's, there's a spectrum that we think about when we think about collateral. So think your best case scenario in terms of, so best case scenario used with nuance because your best case scenario as a bank from a, and my interests are protected standpoint would be my client has a $10 million loan and they're going to take $10 million of treasury. They're going to dump it with me. And they're going to say, that's restricted to us. We're not going to touch it. That fully cash backs my loan. And you say- of, of, Yeah, 10-year treasuries, two-year treasuries, whatever. Right. It's, it's, yeah. And, that's you know, whatever you would, any, honestly, any marketable securities book that is like, has it like a, um, you know, the, what's in the book does change the value. So like, for, so for this example, let's even just call it cash. I'm going to put yeah. US dollars in a bank account in the total of 10 million, and I'm going to restrict myself from using them. And in the event that we go bankrupt tomorrow, you're going to say, I had, there was $10 million on that loan and we have $10 million in their bank account. That's ours. We are made fully whole. So your risk department goes, hooray, we're fully protected. Nothing in the world could keep us from recouping these losses. And your sales department goes, crap, we have to give them a really good rate if they're going to mm -hmm. do that. So it's, it's that constant push and pull. Um, so another structure that sits somewhere in the middle is we're going to give you the rights to all of our receivables. And normally what that means is like, within some parameters and that's obviously negotiable as is everything. If you can, if you can dream a loan structure, it exists out there somewhere, I assure you. Um, but for this purpose, I think, you know, the, the common one is like at any given moment, so like once a month, you owe us an AR aging report and we will take, you know, anything from like, you know, with that's current to like overdue 60 or, you know, however you want to set that you don't necessarily want to accept receivables that appear to be uncollectible. So you, you manage that a little bit and you say, okay, you've got $10 million in collectibles. And then you mark that down a bit and you say, you have $10 million in AR. We're going to give you access to $8 million of your loan next month. We'll check back in. And then at any given point in that month, if they were to go bankrupt, they, they've only drawn as much on their line of credit as they have in receivables. And then the bank has to go, get those receivables, but they have contractual rights to them. 
So that sort of sits somewhere in the middle. So you've got your best tier fully cash backed, your middle tier receivables. Um, and then you've got like on the far other end, companies and this is mostly for, I would say like businesses that make under $50 million a year where they just, they're too small to have the, like either the reserves or, you know, cause like some businesses, they don't realize their value in reserve in um, not reserve, sorry, receivables at any given time. It's just not their structure. And so they may not have the capital to cash back it and they may not have a reserve structure that you can tie to it. And so on the far, far end of the spectrum, you've got the companies that literally the collateral is like their desk chairs and their computer monitors and their like mouses. That's dramatic, but coffee cups. It's, yeah. it's literally like, we're going to go into your office after you shutter and like pilfer whatever we can for whatever we get. And, um, you know, a lot of people I think would more or less consider that uncollateralized. Um, it's certainly on the farthest end of pr putting up any type of collateral. And then um, you don't really see a lot of truly uncollateralized commercial loans. Hey there, sorry to interrupt. Announcement. Blockworks is hosting an event called Permissionless in September. It's a crypto event. It's in Austin, Texas. We did Permissionless in 2022. It was the biggest and best DeFi event in the world. And this year, Lightning will be striking twice. Historically, our ticket prices have gone up about 10 times from the day the tickets go live to the day before the event. If you're like me and bad at math, that's 900%. So it might be savvy for attendees to consider buying tickets now rather than later. If you're listening to this and you're saying, Hey, Jack, I'm not really into this whole crypto thing. I want to hear about the Fed. I want to hear about the dollar, Bretton Woods, three, four, five. I hear you. I'm not telling you to buy a ticket and the interview will resume momentarily. However, if you are into the crypto thing and permissionless is something you might want to attend, what I'm saying is there's no time like the present because tickets will go up and if history is any guide, prices will go up a ton. Anyway, the link is in the description and you can get an additional 10% off by using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Right. And uh, Alex, in 2020 and 2021, there was a huge bonanza of uh, like bond issuance. So banks are often involved in bond issuance and may, they, they may retain some of the bonds in their portfolio, but those are not bank loans. They're you know uh, facilitated by a bank, a, a company issues it, and then the bond is owned by a bond fund and, and then it's owned by ETFs, you know, investors and, and the like. Uh, so there was a huge Bubble, bubble in bonds. As a result, you know, companies didn't need that much money. So there actually wasn't that much corporate lending in 2020 and 2021, as opposed to 2022, where it did pick up markedly. What do, yeah, what do you know about uh, how bank activity, particularly your your world of, uh, I guess it's called middle market banking or commercial banking. I don't know yep. if that middle market is the right term. Yep. Um, how does that go in a, in a, in a cycle? Uh, and when something picks up, is that necessarily a good sign for the economy, a bad sign of the economy? Yeah. There was a sentiment shared in the Bank of America call that I've heard before in other scenarios, and it is intended to sound nice, but it's almost never a good thing. And that is, we're going to be cautious about the new clients we contract with, and we're going to take care of our customers. And that means a couple of things. And so they're saying that at the same time, they're, for, they're, they're suggesting that loan growth is still possible this year. And the way that both of those things can be true is there is a lot of untapped line of credit just out there in, in corporate America. And, and part of it is, is the, the bond issuances, as you said. And, um, you know, part of it is just things have been good, right? And so for the terms that exist right this second, you know, a large corporation might have a $100 million, you know, I, I was on a deal team for a $1 billion line of credit for a company. And, and sorry, Alex, can you explain a line of credit? It's that that number doesn't mean that your bank had to hand over a billion dollars, right? It's a, it's, a, it's an agreement that they can draw upon, but that they uh, and your bank has to set aside the reserve, maybe, but it's not uh, as if they give the billion dollars then, right? Correct. Yep. So in a term loan, banks cutting a check for a billion dollars and a line of credit, the bank is providing access to up to a billion dollars with some of those collateral 
combinations is leading that needing to say up to rather than just here's a billion dollars. But for really good, you know, grade A companies, triple A rated, they're they're going to get huge lines of credit and full access to it. And the loan growth that I suspect we'll see in the next couple of quarters, it's going to be existing bank customers increasing their utilization of their existing lines under the terms that they negotiated when things were better and rates were lower. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, in the second quarter, the will come, well, you know, first quarter earnings in the second quarter will all come around and say, oh, loan growth improved in a high rate environment. How great is that? That's so good for bank earnings. But I think we have to ask ourselves, is it a good thing if that's the dynamic that's playing out under the hood? Right. So let's say, you know, I'm my company is a company that it's a technology company that went public or something. And there was a time when money for my company was very abundant, but now it's not the case. And I wanted to go to a bank and let's say, you know, you're the bank. Um, easy to imagine. Uh, and you're you want to do more business with Apple, who, you know, you're going to give them a 10 basis points over Fed or something, an extremely sweetheart <laughs> deal uh, that I mean, it makes sense. Apple's, yeah. you know, they'll be able to pay you back much yeah. more so than me. But you're going to you know, you might pick up my calls. We might, you know, chat for a little bit, but you're you're more likely to you want to do business with Apple and not with me or or some other you know uh, kind of random company that you you don't know if they're credit worthy or not. I think there is definitely an element of the devil, you know, in in all of this, um, and that's you know that's true. It's very very true because when you think about so the way that there's so there's a scale in banks that help them negotiate creating a universal credit box that like, you know, thousands of people in the company are underwriting loan. You know, maybe that's dramatic depending on the size of the bank, but like you're a bank of 60,000 people. You've got a bunch of people underwriting loans in different sectors and you need a way to create, you know, we call it a box and here's our risk box. And if you go outside of the risk box, that's, you know, an escalation to risk in some form or fashion. And we need to see X, Y, and Z things. Um, so, Part of the way that they box that in, so to speak, is they have a probability of default rating where they'll say everyone in our corporate loan book is going to be a one or they're going to be a 13. And the one is going to be like a AAA rated public company. And the 13 is going to be some a company that makes $20 million a year and we don't have anything but their desk chairs. Or, you know, I, well, at a 13, they're probably already showing signs of deterioration. And they're going to say... If you're a PD 8 to 13, you have to go through a pretty intense quarterly review process where the whole deal team needs to show up to a risk committee and continue to argue that we should still do business with that customer. So when I say like the devil you know, I mean it because the customers that they have their eye on, they know really well. And, you know, they know the quirks. They know, you know, they can they can spot things earlier than you can when you're still getting to know someone. So, you know, I I don't know that it's so much like a top-down strategy where they're saying like, whoa, 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 RMs, be careful. But they're they're being mind RM being relationship manager, that yeah. that quarterback of the deal. Um, I'm glad that you said that. I thought you meant risk manager. So I'm glad. Thank you. Um the most fun part of banking is the acronyms, for sure. <laughs> Again, with making yeah. everything as difficult to understand as possible. It's all about the RWAs. <laughs> um, and how do the current default rates compare to when you were in the business? I One of my pet peeves, Alex, one of my few pet peeves, is when something is at like seven basis points, so 0.07%, and then it goes to 14 basis points, and people say, it's doubled as if it's 0.14% is high, you know? And so current uh, rates of delinquency, current rates of default, uh, charge off NCOs, another acronym, however you want to define it, they are going up over the past year. And I expect, as bankers expect, they will continue to go up, but they are still below where they were in 2019, 2018. And they are a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, where they were in 2008 or 2009. So yeah, how, how would you uh, est establish the current level of, of default? That's, you know, pick, pick your banks. I mean, maybe JP Morgan or Bank of America, because we've been focusing on those. And then, yeah, how high do you think it has to 
go before, you know, the, the, the C-suite of those banks start to sweat a little bit. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, something you heard uh, repeated on the calls earlier this morning was, oh, NCOs are normalizing, which mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think is their way to say, yeah, yeah, we see it. We see what you see, but it's off of nothing. It's, it's that same, like, don't take the 14 basis points and say JP Morgan doubled net charge offs. It's normalizing, but they they're fairly vague on what their expectations for normal is. So um, Bank of America actually included some really uh, neat charts. If you're, if you're a chart nerd, like I am in their um, presentation this morning. And I think that was probably getting ahead of some of these questions in terms of, you know, what they really wanted to do and they were smart to do it is they have a line graph and they included 2008 where charge offs were. And yeah, when you look at it like that over time, and there was a blip in um, 2016, 2017, I think, and then it kind of like comes back down again, close to zero. And, you know, those, the, uh, the, the margins on a chart like that, when you've got 2008 factored in just sort of, you know, they, it continues to double down on the, yeah, look, it's tiny. So like, it's up a little bit, but it's normalizing. And then it's like, okay, well, what is normal though? And at what point do we say this is not normal? And at what point do we start paying attention to the leading indicators of net charge offs and, you know, which Mm -hmm. is delinquencies. So we have a good, a good amount of visibility into people that are behind on their payments. It's basically like a, you know, it's an, it's a receive or AR aging schedule basically, but for their consumer and commercial loan books and, you know, I got the sense on the calls earlier that it was kind of like, yeah, the the lagging indicator NCOs are up and the leading indicator delinquencies are up. But like, don't worry about that. Credit's fine. And it always reminds me of that. You know, they put together all of those flip wheels in 2000, you know, late 2007 of like every single bank CEO being like, credit's never been better. <laughs> and it's it's not to say I'm forecasting some catastrophic event, but, you know, I I think we do need to be careful about the way that we talk about it and the way that we understand leading indicators of credit stress. What else uh, stuck out to you either on the earnings call or the, the presentation you know, beyond the world of just commercial banking, anything in particular? Yeah, sure. So um, a couple of things I heard people say, um, you know, just on the on the street this morning is there's this idea that we're continuing to talk about the bank provision environment as compared to 2020, um, which irks me a bit because it's not quite right. Um, So there was an accounting guidance change in late 2019 called CECL. And it's something that they came up with the Fed came up with, I don't know, probably 2014. I remember at PNC like when the, correct. you know, the project. No, no, Jamie Dimon does not like it. None of the banks are big fans and you you can't blame them. Um, and he is officially tired of being asked questions about it. Um, but the when that got rolled out, it changed the way that new loans for the quarter were reported on in terms of setting that provision, but they also had to do a full book redo and like basically go back in time and pretend that this was the accounting methodology when those loans were made. And so a lot of the timing is purely coincidental that they were taking these large provisions at the same time they were having to run a new CCAR scenario that reflected more of a pandemic uh, like assumptions for the economic so indicators. Secret, secret the stress test? Yes. So to take to take a step back, um, CCAR is an annual stress test. It's banks with more than $50 billion in assets need to complete it. And basically what the Fed does is they come up with I don't know, 30-ish economic variables under three scenarios that they think best reflects what is going to be the catalyst for the next recession. 
And so the, the really smart thing that they do that I appreciate is they don't just run 2009 over and over and over again. They've taken a, they've taken stock of what's going on and they say, we, like most people, including myself, believe that the tightening that's going to be the catalyst for the next downturn is going to be in the corporate space. And so for the last few years, the scenarios that have guided the stress test, um, which operationally is actually incredibly complex and um, has been a huge lift for banks, which they basically have to take this list of 30 variables and run it through their entire balance sheet and sort of spit out what their CT, CET1 capital looks like at the end of it. Um, and so for years, they've been running this test, this, this scenario of it's going to happen in the corporate bank, bank. Everyone trash your corporate loan books as bad as you could possibly imagine. So take like the most doomsday economist and multiply him by 10. And we need to know that you are still solvent. When the pandemic happened, they went, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, we guessed wrong, as would it, anyone in the whole world. Um, we need you to rerun that same process, but we want you to trash your hospitality book and your cruises. And they, they, they tailored Airplanes, it. Airplanes, things, things that are what did were completely shut down during the pandemic. Right. And also, you know, in the, the 2008, it was all about residential mortgages. Exactly. There was a huge boom in in housing in 2020. Exactly. So they they said, we need to re-engineer this test and you need to go through this same sort of like off-cycle test to say, if this is 10 times worse than we think it's going to be for industries that are most affected, you know, right off your airlines, right off your restaurants, right off your hospitality, we need to know that you're still solvent. And so that was a conversation that was happening at the same time that this accounting guidance changed and so when you put the two together, it looks like everyone ran a pandemic stress test and then upped their provision when really they were two sort of isolated incidents. So what's the consequence of that, that they over provisioned and then that's why they had a lot of free money that they could pay out as dividends because losses were so much lower than, they, than expected? Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the consequence for investors was that it was a much larger expense line item on the income statement. Which actually, they, the investors got it all back, right? Because, or, or no? In theory, a lot of them have taken, have sort of reversed that, but that doesn't necessarily one-to-one -one translate into all of that being given back to investors. Because that was also a different, you know, in the same way that they hold their portfolio companies accountable to making good strategic capital decisions in the midst of deterioration, you're going to look really silly if you do a huge share buyback in the middle of a time that is hard to predict what's going to happen next. And then you say, oh, shoot, Fed, I need help. Well, Alex, it's been fascinating to hear your take on the banks. You know what you're talking about. And uh, I've learned a lot. I've got to look look up Cecil. And uh, I know our audience walked away with a lot as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh Thank you for having me. I know all of my friends and family appreciate my opportunity to have a, a platform to pontificate that's not them. So really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thanks, Alex. Talk soon. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching.